We are back at it again with another episode of 8020. And today I have someone that, again, like most of our recent podcast episode uh, guest, I have not seen in person in forever. I think maybe pre-pandemic, maybe even further back a year or change pre-pandemic. Uh, it has been a long time, but I appreciate you being here and I'm looking forward to diving in and connecting. Uh, how are you doing today? <laughs> Well, thank you for asking. I'm so excited to see you. Yeah, like you said, I think it was for sure pre-pandemic, so it's been years since I've seen you. Um, I am doing pretty well today. Uh, I will say my uh, grandmother passed last night, but it's, it's okay. It was one of those things that was sort of, we knew it was coming, so I'm a little bit sad, but we're okay. Uh, otherwise, doing pretty well today and planning for my move to New York. So just super busy doing a lot of stuff. I'm very happy to hear that you're excited about the plan to move to New York. Um, was, was the, the loss of the grandma, was that, was that sudden or did, did you kind of see that coming? It was, it was both. So it was a sudden stroke, uh, at the same time she's 89 and we, we sort of knew it was coming at any time. Mm -hmm. Um, but it wasn't sort of like a long drawn out illness. Uh, however, she was in the hospital for about five days. And since the stroke happened, it's just been a very, it was a very quick decline. Of, um, and she was in a coma for most of it. So my family had time to say goodbye and they knew this was coming, but that event happening was sudden. Um, but she did have, um, she was aware enough when it first happened to say that she was ready to go and that she didn't want any intervention. So we're all a lot more at peace with that than if it were sudden or we didn't know if she wanted intervention. It was very easy to sort of plan for the end. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit of my dad looking at me, um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, six hours before he went into a, a coma as well. Uh, and then 72 hours before he passed where he was like, it's my time. Like I don't, it's my time and and you're gonna have to figure this out out here uh, without me, but it's my time to go. Look me dead in the face, gave me a hug. And and uh, I think that that gave me a little bit more peace than it would have been if if it was a, a freak accident or kind of out of nowhere. Yeah. So did do you feel like you got a chance to sort of like say goodbye and have that peace and closure in that way then? I, I would I would say so. I would say that um, it gave me space to act in a way where I could have leaned in emotional maturity. I don't think that I did at the time, but I think retrospectively, um, I'm I'm grateful for having had the time that I did up to the time of my life that I had him. Um, and yeah. then also for even though the, the last 72 hours were atrocious, right? Loud noises, hospice in in house and and was there when he took his last breath. And that to me is one of those things that uh I mean, it's it's definitely impacted me for the rest of my life. Um, would you yeah. say that in in your life, that death affects you the same way that your grandma's death has affected you? Hmm. Do you mean just death in general, like how I tend to take it? it yeah, de death for, for anyone that's close enough to you that you care, a, well, and not to say that you don't care about other people's existence, but someone yeah. that's close enough <laughs> to you that you feel a magnetic pull to, like is, is death of someone in, in that, regard similar to how you feel about your grandma passing? I think so. And to be honest, it's, it has transitioned throughout my life. Death used to be something that was terrifying to me. Even as a child, I remember being extremely fixated on like one day I'm going to die, like just fixated on it. And it was terrifying. And as I've grown and, uh, through sobriety and like all the work on self, um, and things bigger than me, it's become less, less scary. Actually, it's not like a fearful thing. I will never say that it's something I'm excited or happy about. Like I'm, I definitely wasn't happy to lose my grandmother, but I think there's a lot more peace in it. And it's inevitable for all of us. It's inevitable for everyone we love. And there's a lot of peace just in knowing when someone is ready and they want to go. There's a lot of peace around it because in that way, then I can sort of remove myself from it. It's not like, how is this affecting me? Like, it's making me so sad. I'm going to miss them. It's more like, how is it affecting them? How are they feeling about it? Are they ready for it? So yeah, in a lot of ways, I would say now it's that way for everyone. Now to say if, you know, one of my 
parents were to pass tomorrow. I don't know, but um, I think in the most part, as long as I feel like people are at peace, then I'm able to sort of remove myself from that equation. And I think that's what's helping me this time. I was really close to my grandmother and I thought for many years, like just sort of, I was preparing myself when she goes, I'm not going to be okay. And I'm okay because she said she was ready. And it's like, okay, well, it's not my choice anymore. It doesn't really matter. Like I'm allowed to be sad, but it matters a lot less if she is ready, then that's good for her. How long has that been the case for you to have that level of peace if somebody else is ready? Honestly, probably the last year and a half, the amount of time that I've been sober, sober, a lot's changed for me in that. Um, And I would say it's within the last year that a lot of peace has come to me for death and other things of that nature, just sort of in general, allowing things to be without trying to control them in any way. Can you point to any, any practice in your life, any one practice? Um, that has brought you that piece? Meditation, a hundred percent. So type? I, um, I do, so I do two meditations every day, every morning, every night, and they're both different. So in the morning, it's 10 minutes when I first wake mm-hmm. up before I ever look at my phone, uh, five to 10, depending on how much time I have, but mm-hmm. it's literally just me sitting in the bed and just saying, thank you over and over again, and maybe processing whatever is bothering me that morning. Sometimes I wake up really anxious and I just sort of walk through like, what are you worried about? What are the consequences? What can you control? What can you not control? And just sitting there and giving my brain a minute. And in the evenings, I do a guided meditation. Um, And I do Yogi Brian's meditations. He's got hundreds and it's, can be for grief. It can be for anger, for sadness. He has them for headaches, like whatever my mood is that day. I follow that one. And again, once that's done, then I just sit and process for a few minutes and let whatever's going to happen in my brain happen. And then I I can drop that off and go to sleep. Oh, wow. So is that kind of, that's the last thing that you do at the end of the day? Yeah. Some sort of guided meditation and then it's lights out. Yeah, it's very strange because sleep used to be a really difficult thing for me. So once I added in that routine, I foam roll right before that, then I meditate and then I get in bed. And I used to read to help me like transition into sleep, but I don't even read anymore because after I meditate, I'm just now that I'm used to meditating, I'm able to sort of come down and come to a very calm space. And a lot of times I will just lay in my bed for a minute before I've even turned off the light and fall asleep. And then I'll wake up, you know, like half an hour later <laughs> and have to turn off the light. But yeah, it's the last thing I do and it brings me a lot of peace. And so, yeah, it's come full circle. Like that's the one practice that's like mm-hmm. really bringing me peace in all areas of my life. Yeah. that That's interesting. How, I mean, is there any specific way that you came to having that kind of meditation practice with like it being, not only twice a day, but then different things for the day? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, So it's sort of, it all started with me needing routine in my life. Mm -hmm. So when I first started looking at uh, cutting out alcohol, it was a very, it was like a six year long process Mm -hmm. figuring it out for myself. But the first step was just sort of getting well and coming Mm -hmm. out of not hibernation because I was obviously alive and moving and doing things, but it felt like a mental hibernation for all of my adult life while I was drinking, just like not paying attention to what I was doing every day, like reacting rather than responding to life. And so that one of the first things I put into place was meditation. And it started with just once a day at night and like needing routine Uh, because what I started to do was like reading books by authors who had gone through similar situations and had healed and just become really like powerful, strong humans. And the one thing they all said was that they had routine and they had meditation. So that was the first thing I put in place. So for about six years now, I've had a very solid morning and night routine. And that's where the meditation came in and started at night. But the reason the morning started was because I noticed that I do wake up with anxiety and I generally like wake up in a, like a shit mood. And I I don't know why I've just always 
been like that. And so I was like, what if I spend 10 minutes in bed to just literally adjust my attitude before I get out of bed? And that was three or four years ago. And I've been doing it ever since. And if I don't, then I have, who knows how I'm going to wake up. And again, I'm just then reacting to the day rather than deciding how it's going to go for me. Wow. So six years, it's, it's taken you to, to get to the place where you're at with the alcohol and yes. meditation was something that about two years into that stint, you mm-hmm. found that you've been implementing since. Yeah. Cause I started trying all sorts of things about six years ago when I first started going down this journey, trying routines, meditation, and just, it was, you know, four or so years ago when I started doing it every single day. So it takes, that's the thing. It's like, it's all a process. It's like, you start thinking about it, you do the research, you dabble in it, and then eventually it starts to stick. So it it took a while. Same with sobriety. It took what, four or so years of Mm -hmm. thinking about it before I ever actually did it. So it's all just a long process. So it's been almost like a decade journey. It's been four years of thinking and and six years of (laughs) of trying to implement. Well, I would say, so Mm -hmm. I'm, about to be 39 and I Hello. started thinking, skin be looking like you're 21. Let's go. Thanks. It's um Botox, but <laughs> let's so go. I started thinking about sobriety when I was around 30, 31 though. So wow, you just made me realize it has almost been a decade, which is I was just wild. doing simple math. I'm no mathematician, but it sounded like it was close <laughs> to 10 years. Yeah, I'm like, no, it's definitely not been 10 mm-hmm. years. And then when you do the math, I'm like, oh yeah, it kind of almost has. So it's been a very, very long journey that I've known I needed to go on, but I was just like, nope, not going to touch that right now. Yeah. Was it, was it one action? Was it one situation? Was it one type of reaction or was it a, a combination of a ton of things that led you to not only the understanding that you need to get sober, but made it real for you actually needing to do it? Yeah. It was several different instances. A lot of times you'll hear of one rock bottom and then Mm -hmm. someone will get sober. So what I had were like a series of rock bottoms and then a try and then a bottom and then a try and then a bottom over and over and over again. Uh, But what first started it actually, and I'm still like, I've, I've still never told her thank you, but what got me thinking about sobriety was one of my best drinking buddies Uh, she moved away and then we met up in Atlanta for a dinner one night and I was like oh like she's gonna be in town it's gonna be a crazy night I might as well like drink my water and get ready and I go to meet her for dinner and I order a glass of wine and she's like oh I'm not drinking like I realized I was drinking too much and I need to get sober and it's a problem for me and that was just like the first little drop into the bucket and I was like, oh, sobriety is a thing. Like I didn't really know much about it. Um, So it had never occurred to me until then. I just knew it was a problem. However, I didn't know it was a problem in the way that it was a problem because I grew up thinking of alcoholics as you're an alcoholic or you're not. And if you're an alcoholic, you live under a bridge, you have no home and that's what it is, or you're fine it was just like that dichotomy of one or the other. So I was always like, well, I'm fine. Uh, Mm -hmm. But once she started talking about sobriety for her and just healing herself and getting better, and if alcohol is a problem for you, then it's a problem. That's when I started looking at it and thinking, wow, okay, I think it's a problem for me too. And uh, so that was just sort of a drop and probably went a little, another year or two before I thought about it again. Uh, but then it just continued to come up. And I remember in my brain, it would sort of come up. Sometimes I'd be journaling or just thinking, and I'd be like, oh, I'm going to have to deal with this alcohol problem one day, but not yet. And then I remember one day I cried because I was like, not only are you going to have to deal with it, you're probably going to have to like talk about it with people. And yeah, I got really upset that day. And then again, just like dropped it for a while. And uh, then I cheated on a boyfriend once. I tried to get sober, started drinking again. I ruined a family vacation, um, <laughs> got sober again. And then this last time when I actually got sober, um, I've been sober for 19 months now. 
I joined a community and started going to meetings and like getting support. And I think that was the big, um, that's what did it for me. But yeah, it was just a series of all these happenings before I figured it out rather than just one. So was the rock bottom infidelity and ruining a, um, a family get together or a family trip? I mean, was that, was that really what you would consider the rock bottoms were those two, those two instances or there, there are other things that, that happened that you're like, yo, James, I don't even know if I want to tell you this. (laughs) Well, God, yeah, there are those two. That's, Mm -hmm. that's the problem. Like I was an, I was an alcoholic. Um, Mm -hmm. I loved, loved drinking, but for me, when I look back on that time of starting to get sober, those two instances infidelity and ruining the family vacation. Those were the two times that I was like, okay, this is a bigger problem because it's affecting everyone else. And when I say I ruined a family vacation, I mean, it is the only time in our whole lives that our whole family has gotten together, like grandmother, cousins, uncles, husbands, wives, kids, like the only time that we've all been together and I ruined it, uh, through my drinking and, my antics. So that was a time where, I mean, my parents got into a fight about it. It was just, for me, that's a rock bottom. And at the same time, I would just say it was, it was a steady decline, but also my, all of my twenties and my college, Mm -hmm. it was just all, it's all a wash. Like, I don't even remember most of being in college. It's just, it And I didn't realize, like I said, it was a problem until I started going through sobriety and like Mm -hmm. looking at it. And now, even now looking back, like last night, I looked at some pictures from my cousin's wedding from years ago. And I was like, wow, I was so sick then. And I didn't even know just looking at my face, it looks like a different person, but I I had no idea. How'd you get there? to that moment? No, to to the place where alcohol became such commonplace in your life, then it <clears> took <throat> over your life. Like how how did because I I think that there's a lot of people that that probably abuse alcohol more than they should, right? There's a mm-hmm. lot of people that use alcohol and think that they're using it and it's <clears throat> in fact using them. And I th- I'm pretty sure that both of us, it, you know, off camera we're not going to out people all over the place. It's not what this is for, but I could point to a couple people in my life that I'm like the alcohol is using you. I can tell you right now, right? And I can tell you a time in my life where alcohol used me, right? Mm-hmm. That just the same. And because I've been there, I can tell you that that's happened right now to these people. Uh, but I guess, I guess I'm, I'm I'm very curious about the origin story. Like, How did you even get to a place where alcohol was so commonplace with living that it became a massive problem? Oh, yeah. I mean, that's a great question. And I love the way you put that alcohol using you. I like that because that's exactly what it does at some point. Uh, so it came from my, my real father. When usually when I talk about my dad, it's, it's my stepdad because he raised me from six, Mm -hmm. but my real father, uh, biological father. Yeah. My biological father was an alcoholic. His dad was an alcoholic. His dad's dad, they're all alcoholics, Mm -hmm. like textbook definition. In fact, my biological father passed away of liver disease from drinking a couple of years ago. And I didn't like, I didn't know him. So it was, mm-hmm. it was sad and it wasn't sad, but anyways, so that's how it started. Like I very much had a predisposition predis- towards drinking. And it's interesting because my mom and my stepdad, for that reason, they never drank with us when we were growing up. Like, I don't remember my parents ever drinking. I think one night they had like some rum and they did it after we went to bed. Um, but they were very careful about that. And we grew up in church and they tried really hard to like steer us away from that. But it was, you know, from childhood trauma from before my biological dad was gone from our lives, you know, when your subconscious brain is forming, unfortunately, that's when I was with him. So I grew up with a lot of anxiety, a lot of abandonment issues. I was really shy. We moved around a lot. When I was a kid, uh, like every two years, I went to four different high schools. Like I just had, it was just a rough, I had a rough go of like Mm -hmm. 
just figuring out how to be a person. And then you're all, when you're the new kid in school, like people make fun of you and it's hard to make friends. So when I was 15, one of my friends invited me over. She lived across the street and her parents were out for the night and they had a bunch of alcohol in the house. And mm-hmm. we drank that night. And I remember everybody else, like my friend, her sister and my sister were all like, Oh, this is so gross. And I specifically remember being like, Oh yeah. Oh, I, I like the burn. Like in Mm -hmm. my, I loved it because in that moment, I also felt not anxious anymore. I was like confident and I was ready to talk to people. And then I used that throughout high school and college Like that's how I made friends. And I was like, if I can't go drink with this person, I don't know how we're ever going to get to know each other because we won't have one of those like long, deep talks. So that's like what I thought was bonding and what was real. And then as I just continued to go through my twenties, I just, I think that's what I started to lean on. And it's the only way I knew how to connect with people. It was the only way I was able to have sex for a long time. It was the only way I was able to be open with my partners. It was just, it was a crutch. So instead of like, it almost bridged that gap between an awkward little kid to an adult. And I just used it as a really slippery, dangerous bridge, to be honest. And eventually just became a full-blown alcoholic. Like I just loved it. And I didn't know what socializing meant without it. And I was very sick, you know, through my twenties, definitely. Yeah. It it sounds like we, you know, through usage of alcohol that maybe there was a, there was an association that was maybe even a causal link for you between emotional depth yes, and, and connection and, um, the abdication of abandonment and, and everything that everyone, that everyone's like, Hey, this is what you're looking for in a partner. This is what you're looking for in a a marriage or relationship. This is what you're looking for in friends. Did you feel through your twenties and up until you got to the place where sobriety has now been a thing that you couldn't have all of that goodness without the means of the alcohol? Oh yeah. I didn't understand how any of that could be mine. Uh, I think a lot of it was confidence, um, social anxiety, anxiety in general, and just being a lot of times I'll describe it as like being asleep. I felt like I was asleep for a lot of my adult life, like just sort of coasting through. So I didn't even think about better things being mine or like partners being mine. It was just like, oh, that will not be mine unless I was drunk. And then it was like, Oh, anything can be mine. Any person can be mine. And like, yeah, I just, I think that's the only way I thought about things. Wow. It sounds like you're two different people. One, when you're sober, right. When you have no alcohol at that given moment in your system at, at that point in your life where you're anxious, you're perhaps depressed, you're perhaps not understanding how you're going to do this whole thing. The minute that alcohol hits the, the system, we're a completely different person. We're a life of the party. We're running around feeling super confident. Hey, any woman or man or, or whatever can be mine if I want them because mm-hmm. I have that confidence now with a little liquid courage. Oh, yeah. A hundred percent. That's what it was. And oh, I had a good point for that. I completely forgot it. Um But yeah, that liquid courage, like that really, that changed it. And uh, yeah, that's what I was going to say. There is, it's a hundred percent. Like I'm a different, was a different person with alcohol and without it. And the, the crazy thing about being in alcohol addiction is that there's this, this middle place too, that almost keeps you stuck more than the alcohol itself. So it's like super confident person drinking, blah, me, whatever, when I'm not drinking, but there's this middle ground of like being hungover and 
cleaning myself up and eating really well for a couple of days and thinking about how am I going to heal from the alcohol into this little hump of where I'm feeling good for a few days. And then it's like, okay, now I'm going to plan a date and like a night out and a cool outfit so I can like pick up whoever, do whatever. And then I'm planning for that. And then there's the drinking. And then it's just like this up and down cycle of even if I'm not drinking on a particular day, like I was thinking about it or planning for it or healing from it or picking myself up from it. It was just an obsession. And that's actually what stopped me from doing well at jobs and like applying myself to literally anything was just this constant obsession of like, when are we going out next? Or how am I going to make myself feel better from the last time I went out and did something ridiculous? So it's just a constant it's an obsession. It was for me. Looking back retrospectively, it sounds like you, you do a lot of journaling now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Decent amount. Would you say that, would you say that alcohol was a conduit to your addiction to chaos or Mm. were you addicted to alcohol? Both. Yeah. Um, I was, I was, definitely addicted to alcohol. And what I found, especially in recovery rooms is a lot of times people are addicted to chaos and what's underneath all of that. For me, I was straight up. I loved alcohol. Um, but I was also really addicted to chaos. And, uh, it's funny you bring that up because what I've realized in sobriety was one of the things that I was addicted to was like this feeling of, being out of control and not knowing what was going to happen. Like if I went out sometimes I was like, well, I better pack like a little bag and I better pack this and this and this, because I didn't know what was going to happen next or like what sort of chaos I was going to cause in my life. And there was a, like a very dark part of me that liked that. And about six months into my recovery, I was going out with one of my friends to Nashville And I remember on the way to Nashville getting sad because I was like, I want to drink tonight. And then I thought, I don't actually want to drink. What I miss is the feeling of going to Nashville and not knowing what's going to happen. Because in sobriety, that's not the case. I don't feel that way now, but like then I missed the feeling of being out of control because now I am always in control and like painfully aware sometimes of what's going on. And I just sort of missed like the little dark side of me was like, Oh, I just want to come out and like do something wild tonight. We don't know what it's going to be yet. Um, and now that's what keeps me from drinking because now that's terrifying to me. I'm like, Oh, I don't want it. Is it terrifying for you because you, you want to maintain the control because you feel like the control that you have now is some semblance of a reality that is better than it used to be? Or would you say that it, it freaks you out that the the control might go away because you, you truly just aren't that person and don't want to slip back in? Both. Um, I would say the reality now is it's not even a semblance of reality. It, the reality now is better. And like my life is better and who I am so much better. And I think it's scary for me because I know how easy it would be to slip every time that I've been sober in the past and slipped and started drinking again. It's because somebody said, no, it's fine. Just have one little sip. And I would have one sip just to like appease them in that moment. And then like the, the monster that lives in my brain like that is alcoholism was immediately like, okay, well we need another drink immediately. Uh, so I know how easy it is to slide back. And it's terrifying to think that it would be that easy because that person that I was before, she doesn't exist anymore. And I've had to tell people that from my past, like the Taylor that you knew in 2016 or before doesn't exist anymore. Like you have to get to know me now. It's like a new person. Um, so it's just, I think it's, it's all of the things it's, it's just scary to think that I could ever go back and be so far asleep and be so mm-hmm. selfish and out of control and not like myself with one, one sip. 
so easy. Are there more people that that knew you in a different time that are unwilling to meet you where you are today? Or would you say there's more people that knew you at that time that are willing to meet you as who you are today? I would say I'm fortunate in that most people are willing to meet me where I am today. And in this process of getting sober this time, I've sort of released everyone who's not or like isn't willing to meet me in that space, at least while we're together, um, then they're, they're not in my life anymore. So I'm very fortunate in that the friends that I have now from my past are very much willing to like meet me where I am today, which is wonderful and probably part of what keeps me sober. Is there, would you say that there's any part of you though, when, when you weren't sober that you wish you had a specific part, not with the alcohol, but a specific part of who you were then now? Hmm. That's a great question, James. I think for me, probably the part of me that felt like she was really fun. Now, whether that was like really actually fun or not is Mm -hmm. to be debated, but I definitely (laughs) felt like, Mm -hmm. you know, and pretty much until I got sober that I always thought of myself as really fun. I was like fun person. Hey, this is the fun girl, the the one that can always bring a life to the party, the one that people want to be around all the time. Yeah. And even if you like went on a date with me, like we would definitely have fun. And now I'm not, I don't know that. I'm not sure of that. Like, I know we'd have a great conversation, Mm -hmm. but would we have fun? I don't know. And that's kind of the thing about being sober. Um, Let's say a year and a half sober. I feel like I'm a, a year and a half old. Like, if you were to ask me right now, what's my hobby? What do I do for fun? I don't like, I don't have an answer for you. I don't know because it was drinking for 18 years or however, you know, like, mm-hmm. so I think I do miss, there's still that part of me that misses that side. That's like mm-hmm. a little out of control and like a little bit fun. And I do believe that I'll find her in a healthy way. Mm-hmm. I just haven't found her yet. What does fun mean though? I don't, that's the thing. I don't know because for me, fun was always, fun was always going out and like meeting someone at a bar and doing something wild. And now what is, what does fun mean to me? I don't know, but the, the closest thing that I could get to it, that the closest that I get to it right now is being in a flow state. And that's just where you get so lost in an activity that you forget about the rest of the world because you're just like, you're so in that moment, you enjoy what you're doing so much, like nothing else matters. So for me, that's like, that's the closest thing to fun, but I still don't think that's necessarily fun. That is what I'm still trying to figure out. But when you say not necessarily fun, not necessarily fun to someone else that's judging you based on their own fun. Or not necessarily fun to you? Probably what you said, probably the first, yeah, other people's thoughts of what should be fun. Because sometimes to me, fun is like, I love just sitting on my couch and like watching garbage television. Now that you Mm -hmm. bring it up, like, I do know that's fun for me. Mm -hmm. Like, I love watching Below Deck. That's like my favorite activity. (laughs) But (laughs) yeah, so I think that's, that's a loaded question. If you can't tell, like that's a, has been a big part of my recovery is like finding, finding my fun and my hobbies and being able to like still be in control and well, and also like have fun and let loose figuring out where that is sober and okay, I guess. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a dichotomy and sounds like also perhaps you're changing fun from an outcome, from an object to being a verb. Yeah, absolutely. And just getting, getting lost in just something that I, yeah, that you enjoy because I mean, sometimes when I'm like, I'm going to have fun on the weekend and I'm not going to do anything this weekend and just relax. What I end up doing is just working on my business. I'm like, That's fun to me, but at Mm -hmm. the same time, I guess that's not what other people would define as fun. But does it matter? Does it matter what other people, what other people define as fun? No, it doesn't at all. Can you see how it really, 
it messes me up that concept. <laughs> but I'm I'm very curious to the to to the root of why that messes you up. Uh, do you think that you're maybe applying extra shame or extra pressure to yourself to fit into a mold with the rest of society now that you're sober? Probably, yeah. I think that's very ingrained in us, especially as women too, like to fit into specific molds and like mm-hmm. be certain ways. And I'm sort of unpacking all of mm-hmm. all of that. It's like unpacking the alcoholism and unpacking like what how I care about what other people think, what is fun, like what's expected of me, what does society want me to be versus what I I just want to be. And again, that's where it comes back to that feeling of like, I feel like at 38, I feel like I'm a year and a half old. And I'm like, I'm just figuring all of this out. And I'm just realizing that society and other people and what they think even has an effect on me. Like, I didn't even know that until last year. And, you know, noticing it now, even more as you're saying it, like, I feel like every day, I'm just learning a new thing about life, but also myself who I've been with for over 30 years, <laughs> like just getting to know her, which is it- present without presence. Absolutely. I've physically been present, but that's, that's about it. Yeah. yeah. You've, you've been with her, but you've not been <laughs> paying attention necessarily until yeah. more recently. W- would you say that the people around you, um, whether it be partner or it be family now, or it be friends now uh, that are willing to meet you where you're at right now. Do you, do you think that they're aligned in mission and aligned in definition of, of fun and what, what is work and what does not work and what purpose of life is? For the most part. Yes. Um, do you mean aligned with me or just aligned in general? Um, like you, you view your life as, as ABC. Do you think Mm -hmm. that the people around you closely associate their life also their life mission, their life purpose with ABC? Because I I think that we can always be talking about, uh, we can always be talking about what we would call respect, what we would call work, what we call fun. But if we don't define, if we don't come up with a definition that we can agree upon, we're not talking about the same things. So I'm curious if the people in your life are individuals that you feel aligned with. Yeah. Another great question. I would say for the most part, yes. Right now, that's another thing I've been very fortunate with in my sobriety is I've chosen the people that are close to me now very carefully. I would almost say I even like curated my little circle Mm -hmm. and they are and they aren't like they're all very different people, but Mm -hmm. I would say they're, we're all very aligned in uh, what we think is I don't know. We're all very aligned in the fact that we want to be healthy and we want to continue to grow as humans. Right. But I'd say we're all different individually in what we think is like work versus fun versus what our life's purpose is. Um, Like I'm very, another thing I'm still unpacking is that like I tie very much my worth to, to my work, which I think Mm -hmm. is why I find work on the weekends to be fun because I'm like Mm -hmm. defining who I am and proving my worth. And like, that's something I'm trying to like untangle. And one of my best friends is opposite of that. She hates work. She wants to live in the woods. Like she Mm -hmm. can't wait for her husband to get a great job. So she can just not do stuff. And I love that about her. And then I have another friend who works really hard in her career and uh, does like volleyball on the side as her fun and has a really great balance of like, what's work and what's fun. And, and I feel like I'm sort of meshed in the middle of like still trying to untangle work from worth and fun. And so we're aligned and we're not aligned. Like we're the same and we're very different, but we're just, you know, I, I would say my parents have a super healthy like balance between those two things. So it's really just me that's sort of like still working that out. What does balance mean in this regard? Uh, I think balance in this regard just means they are able to say I'm working really hard in my career and I love it and I can drop it on the weekend or in the evenings and I can find the things that fulfill me outside of work and those things are equally if not more important from 
the work that I'm doing. And, and they all know that their worth is not tied to what they produce or create or how much money they make. And, and that's, that's a thing that I don't know to be true yet. Uh, Mm -hmm. And they, so I guess for me, that's what I mean. Balance is they sort of seem to have figured that out Mm -hmm. and I haven't yet. And that's okay. It's just, it's all part of the, the very long process of healing. Yeah, that's, that's beautiful clarity. I appreciate you. You give me a little bit of of insight there. I, I guess my question would be is with them finding that out for themselves, is that what you want to find out for yourself? That they are I would split? Love, I would, yeah, I would love to find that out. I would love to think that my worth as a human being is not tied to what I produce or create. Mm-hmm. I would love to find that to be true. And at the same time, I don't hate them being tied right now. And that's, that's the interesting part about my healing too, is like mm-hmm. learning how to allow two things to be true at the same time. Cause I've always been like, it has to be one or the other and I have to pick an answer. Mm-hmm. And- a, B, one, zero, like it's yeah. all code. You're like, hold on. That's <laughs> yeah. not, that's not how life works. Yeah. No, it can just, those I would love for it not to be true. And I love mm-hmm. that it's true because if, if nothing else, like I'm creating and producing a lot of things. And I feel like, like I'm giving back to the world. I'm not just like taking all the time. So, and I'm not doing dumb shit, like going, getting drunk. So it has its benefits. Like I, and I enjoy the work that I do. So um, I'll just continue to explore that. Yeah. I think, I think that's fascinating. It sounds like your, your parents are, are very similar to my mom where she has, has great utility in her work. She's a flight attendant. She does honeydew ministry stuff. We grew up in the church. So she does a lot of, um, unchecked and unrewarded charity work, like 501c3 work as she's working a full-time job. Right. And so my mom is a, is a wild woman, very like, that's where I got my work ethic. Her and my dad, I, I can't thank anyone else there. Um, so far as I can see, uh, but it's interesting because she too finds a lot of utility, but then is able to separate and yeah. wants to separate and wants to have reprieve and wants to sit and watch TV, garbage TV, as you, as you would say, and wants to do that. It's interesting though, because I find myself in a position that I don't think is where you're at or where either of our parents are at. And that's that I find utility and find purpose in this game of entrepreneurship. I find utility in my value to the world being solely predicated on what I bring to it, not in gravity of outcome, right? But in my persistence to solve problems that need solving, to help people. And I find zero utility for me and don't enjoy at all watching garbage television. And a lot of people do. I would rather would rather crawl across sandpaper butt naked, straight up. <laughs> and I would like to do that at all. So it's interesting because my my MO would be that I would default to work. That is the default mode, but it's not. I thought for a long time it was because I was trying to prove myself. And maybe when my dad died, it was. Mm-hmm. But where I sit today, I'm just like, just enjoy it. I've been in multiple different industries. I've been in multiple different directions, trying to get to, to high places to bring more value to the world, to solve problems. I love that shit. And I would rather, even when all of my family, all of my friends, uh, well, not all my friends that I, hang out with now, but at some point in my life, like, why don't you come out and drink? Why don't you come out and hang out? Why don't you just come home for the whole day on a Tuesday in the middle of the day and come hang out with your little nephew? Like, hold on. I hear you. And I appreciate that that is the direction that you want me to go. But for me, that, that feels like prison. Fair. Feels like a trap. Feels like I'm living a reality that I so adamantly do not want. And I knew that when dad died but I do not want y'all's life. I love you so dearly and I take a bullet for you, but I do not want your life at all. Wow, that's really great clarity. And I love that you follow it. Do you ever feel like, I think for me, the garbage TV is is I need to shut my brain down because it's thinking Mm -hmm. all the time and it's just like anxieties and business ideas and blah, 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 like uh, all the time. Where do you find those moments of turning it off or do you need them? The gym. Ah. Jiu-jitsu. Okay. L- slam- CrossFit. Okay. Jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Legitimately. Nice. In the okay. in the heart locker. 
right? With weight on my back, moving 20 miles at a time. That is where I find that, where it's completely silent, where everything is gone. The naysayers, my my fragile little ego sometimes, everything is gone. It's not, I feel trapped. In fact, I feel like I'm I'm almost, if you could envision, like there's a hole in the ground. There's, there's, you know, we're in the jungle. There's a trap. You fall through it. When I'm watching garbage TV and I, I figure out, I cognitively am like, oh, wow, I've been sitting here and this is two or three episodes in. I feel as though I'm looking up at the hole in the, the ground floor in the rainforest and falling infinitely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, with probably no way out. No, because there's no ladder, right? I'm just falling. It's just a black hole that gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Right. And I'm just continuing to fall down. And so it's interesting. Like I I can do with partner, right. I can watch a a TV show before we go to bed or I can like pop on a game or we can go do something like that. But if I try to do it mindlessly, my mind just turns on. And it's like, what are you doing, dude? Do you want this? Because if you do, cool, we'll leave you alone. But do you really want this? Because for every way that you live your life, you don't live like you want this. Yeah. So your answer is no, you don't, don't want that. I don't No. Hmm. I don't. It's so interesting. And I mean, your journey is always really inspiring to me. Like the things that you're, you're constantly creating and you're like, you're always doing something new and like creating something and helping someone. And I, I love that. And I think that may be where I struggle sometimes because that's, I, I, feel a lot like you do like entrepreneurship and creating things and helping people is is fun to me and it is exciting and at the same time like you said there's a lot of that pressure from other people of like oh that's not fun but then the garbage tv tv other people don't like like that's lame i would never do that so it's very much of I mean, just hearing you talk about how you feel about it, it's like you're very grounded in like what you feel and what you believe and what is true to you. And maybe that's where I'm I'm working right now in my recovery is like finding that really solid footing and that solid ground. And so it was it's really it was really nice to hear you talk about it in like such clear terms like you're you're very rooted in that and what you believe and and i think taylor i think that some of this could be just the value that you assign to because it's not like people around me don't run their mouth about what i'm doing and don't <laughs> the last time the last person i had on the podcast literally sat at the end we're still recording and it's like well we stopped recording and then she goes do you have any hobbies james like do you do anything when you're not with your girlfriend do you do anything when you're like when you're not working like, when do you not work? When do you not work out? When do you not this? And I'm like, look, I hear you. I understand why you're asking that. And I really appreciate you caring because you're applying your frame of reference for your life to me. Mm-hmm. Yes. But the value yes. that I assign to my frame of reference is higher and greater than the combination of every other person that walks this earth. And it wasn't always like that. Yeah. It wasn't always like that. But for me following the same Taleb, from me engaging with everything that he has, everything that Jordan Peterson has, everything that Grant Cardone has, Alex Hormozzi, Naval Ravikant, and a bunch of other people that are wildly more successful than I am currently. And then going into some philosophy and other things, diving deep into there and having to look at myself in the mirror, I'm like, damn, these, these individuals and the people that they're writing about have gotten to such a high, ridiculous place and are still human. I don't know if you've read Meditations by uh, Marcus Aurelius, um, legitimately the leader of Rome, right? And Meditations are his journal. Mm -hmm. And his ass is struggling with the same thing, leading one of the most powerful nations ever and is still dealing with stuff that you and I deal with on a daily basis, like self-confidence, like what to do with your day. Like, do we have meaning in life? Are we doing anything that's of utility to the world. Yeah. And so there's been, I've been fortunate. I've been very grateful. And I love the way that, that you said you were talking about gratitude earlier. I've been very fortunate to have the right people in the right place to have enough luck to have the right people in the right place to steer me towards people that are deeper than them so that I can learn more. Because had I not had those, my dad's death would have probably taken me a different direction. 
I'm really glad. I feel like I'm glad that you had those people. I feel like it took you a great direction. Like, I feel like you're such, I've always told you this, such a good and mature person and like just a good, good heart, like a good solid soul on you. And I'm, I'm so glad to know you. So I'm glad you've had those people in your life. Yeah, I really, I really appreciate that. Um, that means a lot from someone that's gone through a ton of stuff. You know, I, mm-hmm. I found much more, uh, much more value assigned to and a, a person's opinion that hasn't played in theory land, that hasn't just sat inside and, and been shielded from the world and shielded from the downside. I think, you know, a lot of people in education can give you a pat on the back. But you're like, but what have you done? What yeah. have you done but teach other people about theoretical stuff? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I need people who, as as they say, people have been in the arena as well. Correct. Otherwise, I don't like. I don't need to hear your opinion. <laughs> Absolutely, and, or I mean, you can give it, but I'm probably not going to take it. Yeah, I'm not gonna. It's not gonna like go not in. At all. Not at all. In in all of this, I know that we're we're coming up short on time. We got about another ten here, but in all of this journey, what's been the role of yoga for you? Oh, yoga has been everything. It's was the initial before I even started thinking about sobriety. It was the, the first wellness piece that came Mm -hmm. into my life. Um, so in college I had to like, had to take some electives and I took like, I don't know, ballroom dancing and kickboxing. It had to be like physical. Uh, no, but I, (laughs) I can do, A lot of other dances I don't know the names of. Swing dance is one of them. But that's a start. (laughs) Yeah. So I started in that. I started noticing like how good it felt to like be in my body. And then at some point in my 20s, because my memory is very, very murky back then, I went into a regular gym and they happened to be having a yoga class that day. And I went in there and I took yoga and I remember being just floored at the the connection between mind and body. And I was like, whoa, there's something to that. So um, throughout my recovery and like getting well and in sobriety, like yoga has been a grounding force for me. It's taught me how to be in my body and how to find a quiet in stillness. And it's taught me breath, which is the one tool that we always have access to at all times that will literally calm our nervous system. So taught me about breath. Um, and it taught me to that the way that I quiet my mind in a lot of ways is okay. So I tend to, of course I meditate and I'm fine being still now, but I used to not be. And through yoga, I found out that I could quiet my mind through movement. And so because yoga is so like connected between mind and body and you're moving, but it's in such a mindful and grounded way, I was able to quiet my mind while also moving my body and they call it moving meditation. And so that allowed me to heal in so many ways because for so long I couldn't sit still and meditate, but I could do yoga and I could sit in a warrior too and find these moments of presence and being able to, again, respond instead of react to my day. And I can't, like, I could go on and on about how much yoga has impacted my healing and it will be something that I continue to do until I'm I'm not here anymore. And I want to try to get everyone to do it too. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, it's, it's greatly impacted my healing and uh, my career and my businesses. It's, I mean, it's what I do and it's what I love and firmly believe that it's, it's healing for anybody who who does it. Yeah. It's interesting. I think that, I think that a lot of people get to get to control over mind and control over breathing and control over uh, anxiety and your nervous system in, in different ways. I think a lot of people that maybe might be on the, on the more anxious side that yoga really, really helps um, and I, f- I found it to help me as well. I think that there's there's some other places where people like lacking massive confidence. For me, I don't know about you. Yoga doesn't give me confidence. Slamming no. heavy weights does. Yeah, yoga does not give me confidence. Yoga makes me able to sustain the high output that I'm looking for because I take care of my joints, take care of my ligaments. But I think that there's 
there's utility for yoga. And I think that a lot of men need to, uh, and this is me talking as a man, regardless of what orientation you are, if you a man, you need to get in that damn, in that damn studio and start getting some movement in because this isn't for the ladies. I know you think yoga pants, you think, uh, sweat, you think hair up, you think upside down. Oh yeah. Do you see a ton of men doing that kind of thing? Not really, unless you're in yoga. And then there are men that are at the pinnacle of yoga in yoga. Yeah. You just don't see them if you're not in it, guys. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true if you're not in it. And I think it's very regional too. Like um, being in, a, in Atlanta, for instance, mm -hmm. there was like one man in any yoga mm -hmm. class that I went to. But when I lived in Boulder, where I did my yoga teacher training, it was like almost more men than women mm -hmm. in the class. So it's like very regional. And at the same time, like you said, it, but if you're not, in a yoga class, like you're not seeing, you're not seeing men doing these sorts of things, but it's like you said, very important for men to get in there too. It's, it's all about longevity and like sustainability. And that's how you're gonna be able to lift weights and run and stuff until you're old is by also stretching and taking care of your joints and breathing. <laughs> yeah. And yoga is also permissionless. And I think a lot of people think that, you know, um, you sit into gender roles, you sit into, uh, you know, well, you know, we strong men don't do this, weak men do this and that and the other. And I think it's, it's something that I had to, I had to break too. I mean, that was deeply ingrained in me, like yoga. What am I, a girl? Right. <laughs> that was like the first thing that ever came to my head before I went and got my ass kicked at, uh, wow. at yonder in Atlanta, uh, a stupid amount of times. Um, and, and so I think, you know, yoga is something that, that we could all we could all benefit from, and I know that we're about to wrap here. Um, I want to open up a little bit of the floor for you to uh, let the people know where they can find you. And um, if you're game, we're gonna have to do this again. I think with this time constraint here, <laughs> I would love to do it again. There's so many. I actually had a whole page of like talking oh, points. Wow. Oh yeah, I'm super super type A. Um, but the nothing to do with anything that we talked about today. But I loved our conversation. But yeah, definitely we should do it again. Um, if people want to find me right now, the best place to find me is on Instagram. It's Taylorful with an underscore T A Y L O R F U L little underscore, and that's where I'll be posting all of my um, coaching that I do, uh, yoga classes that I do, and all of it right now is online through zoom, or it can be in person, obviously, if we're in the same area, but I'm taking uh, personal clients right now, women only. So I'm becoming certified as a women's coach and already certified as a yoga teacher. So I'll be taking uh, clients for personal training and yoga. And right now you can find it all on my Instagram. And as soon as I get the website up and running, I will let you know on that. Yeah. And we'll put it in the show notes when you do get that up, just shoot me a text with it and, uh, and I'll update them when that happens. Uh, but we'll put your Instagram in the description, both on all streaming and on YouTube. And, um, yeah, I really appreciate you making the time. I think this is a beautiful conversation. I think we literally just, uh, we, we got to the tip of the iceberg. I think there's so much, there's so much more that, that we could talk about. There's so much more that we will need to unpack and, and communicate about. And I appreciate you making the time. I really do. It means a lot you know, um, really means a lot. Yeah. Thank you for having me. It was great to catch up and this was an awesome conversation. So thank you. Absolutely. I'm gonna stop the recording there, but hold on for two seconds and then we'll get you out of here.